In the early 1990s, the video game industry got Hollywood fever. Thanks to advances in technology, namely the storage space of CD-ROMs, the world seemed wide open to take games from the relatively simplistic and cartoonish graphics of bitmapped art to full-blown film footage. The hope was that if films were made into games, then games would inherently be more cinematic and the player would feel like they were playing a movie. In reality, while the film segment just barely translated over to the medium, the game part was often left behind in the rush. This would lead to the live action games or full motion video craze of the early 1990s, which would sputter and crash by mid-decade. But the dream of uniting movies and games was far from over. As the hardware capabilities of gaming platforms continued to increase, games moved from 2D to 3D, and CD-ROM storage made it possible for real music and voice acting recordings to become a regular part of games as well. So those game makers who had aspired to immerse players in experiences similar to movies found more and more to work with, and gave the world games like Metal Gear Solid, Tomb Raider, and Resident Evil that all quite clearly have heavy inspiration in popular movie genres. At the same time many of these games were tearing up the sales charts on the PlayStation, Nintendo 64 players were being treated to another landmark title that took directly after a movie, with a franchise that makes for another natural fit in the world of video games. GoldenEye 007 Nintendo had acquired the video game license to the James Bond franchise throughout much of the mid-1990s. But being a company that was quite deliberate with its development of games, as well as being in the middle of a transition between console generations, they would only put out two James Bond games during their time with the franchise. A Game Boy game that functions a bit like Zelda, and a first-person shooter developed by their British partners at Rare. This first-person shooter, GoldenEye, would be one of the most popular games for the Nintendo 64 and a seminal title for the entire fifth generation of consoles. It was a couple of things all at once. It was a well-designed first-person shooter. It was a tremendous multiplayer experience. And it was very faithful to the movie it was based off of. The first-person shooter genre was still relatively young when this game was released in 1997 and it was notoriously tough to translate onto consoles. So GoldenEye was one of the very first first-person shooters to be built for the ground up for a console. After Nintendo's rights to James Bond were up, Electronic Arts snapped them up, sensing a potential gold mine after the success of GoldenEye, and during a period of particular focus on developing games based on media properties rather than on original intellectual property of their own. From here, EA would task the studio, Black Ops Entertainment, with tackling the next movie in the Bond franchise, Tomorrow Never Dies. But that studio would turn out to bite off more than they could chew when they put out a game for that film in 1999. Reception was middling, due to the inevitable shadow cast by Goldeneye, and the fact this game went with third-person perspective gameplay instead, which other PlayStation games like Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter also delivered better and more polished versions of. Given another year and another film though, Black Ops Entertainment would take the engine it had built and return Bonds to the gameplay that made it popular by developing The World Is Not Enough as another first-person shooter. This time, with a tried-and-true formula and a previous Bond game under their belt, Black Ops Entertainment managed to, at the very least, match its famous predecessor and in a few places surpass it. The main thing to consider with this game is that while GoldenEye was a very good first-person shooter wrapped up in the Bond license, it could also have fairly interchangeably been a very good first-person shooter without the Bond license. A fact that Rare then went on to prove by using that same engine and gameplay to build Perfect Dark three years later after they lost the license. This latest game actually took more cares to try and place the players in the role of a secret agent and not just a soldier, with the use of Bond gadgets being far more prevalent to accomplish very unique outcomes to situations that running and gunning can accomplish, as well as making stealth a far more tenable way to play through the game. Being a game that came out three years later, 
and had GoldenEye's inspiration, it was pretty reasonable to see this next game as an attempt to build on that sturdy foundation, while also focusing more on putting the player into the role of James Bond. But The World Is Not Enough game was relatively overlooked in its day, because it was released just days before the PlayStation 2, so interest in last generation games was waning. Instead, interest was heavily focused on what these new super consoles could be used to do, and the trend towards cinematic gameplay was only accelerating with this next leap in capabilities. EA would originally seek to have its teams develop an upgraded PC and PlayStation 2 version of The World Is Not Enough, directly taking this game as the basis for its first next-gen outing with the Bond franchise. This new next-generation version of the game would make the cover of Next Generation magazine way back in March of 2000. However, this plan would be thrown off track when EA abruptly cancelled the project about a year later in February of 2001. The reasons given at the time were fairly standard company lines about cutbacks at EA's teams during what was a slight downturn in the gaming market at the time. But some appropriately sleuthing Bond fans wanted to get to the bottom of this cancellation and uncovered another possible reason. That alternative explanation, allegedly involving some corporate espionage, ironically, for which house cleaning and restructuring was allegedly EA's response in order to make it all go away. After canceling a new version of The World Is Not Enough, though, EA now needed something to base a Bond game on. With the next Bond film still a year away, it couldn't get ahead of the film franchise. So, with a sizable amount of work on a next-generation game engine already built for the PS2, and the rights to use the James Bond franchise, they decided the opportunity was too great to pass up, and the chance to fully realize the dream of putting players in the immersive role within their own movie was finally within reach. So, they made up their own Bond movie. There was some early speculation that Roger Moore might have been in the cards to portray Bond for this game, but that ended up not coming to fruition. So, they just sculpted their own Bond, who kind of looks like what you would get if you put all the other Bonds in a blender. And yes, this game far predates the television show Archer, which just kind of goes to show what a solid grip they both had on the Bond archetype. With a fresh-faced new Bond, a different voice actor to play him, and a look-alikes and sound-alikes cast for M and R, the development teams at EA otherwise built up an entirely new universe of characters and scenarios to put players into. They continued using the Quake 3 engine from their original work on the cancelled The World Is Not Enough project, but also said in interviews that they wrote a custom renderer as well as custom lighting and visual effects systems for the PS2. In their words, they were aiming to create the most complete Bond package that had been offered to date, and that meant something else needed to be in there. Cars, racing, and chases. An integral part of any Bond film, and something the games hadn't really managed to capture yet. EA had actually tried to capitalize on exactly this part of the Bond franchise the year before, contracting the small development studio Eutechnics to rework one of the engines from its racing games to create 007 Racing in late 2000. While it was an impressive graphical achievement on the PlayStation 1, the gameplay behind those levels was not quite ready for prime time, and the game was raked over the coals something fierce by critics at the time. Rather than give up on this integral part of the Bond experience, though, they instead brought this part of their new game in-house, and had the Need for Speed team use their experience and their graphics engine to develop the driving levels for this new game. An incredibly wise choice that paid off in spades. So bringing all of its development talents together, and giving them some remarkable leeway to craft their own story and experience, they rebounded from the cancellation of the enhanced port in February, and delivered a finished game in time for the holidays in November of 2001, at least on the PlayStation 2. Unfortunately for all the effort that went into crafting a brand new playable Bond movie in the form of a video game, the game was actually met with pretty downbeat reviews. Not terrible, just middle-of-the-road opinions that it was a take-it-or-leave-it quickie adventure. Perhaps this is a bit like the reception that the next film would get, when Die Another Day would also get mediocre reviews. Both were pegged in a post-9-11 world as being fairly well outside the rapidly shifting zeitgeist. 
relics of the blockbuster popcorn spectacle 1990s that now looked out of touch to an almost insulting degree in a new world where movie villains seemed quite quaint in the wake of real-world terrorism and mass violence. This was also a game that didn't lean heavily into violence, earning it a meager T rating in the era where the M rating was coveted by a certain influential segment of the game-playing market for all of the supposed maturity it conveyed. Of course, we're here to talk about the GameCube, where the game was ported alongside the Xbox in March of 2002. So let's dive into what this extracurricular Bond adventure turned out to be. After a basic trailer intro taken directly from gameplay footage, we get taken to a surprisingly Spartan menu. The first three options are all for setting up your single-player game, starting a mission, and saving or loading your progress. The options don't give us very much either. A difficulty setting, a few controller settings, rumble settings, sound levels, and a couple of control presets. Jumping into the single-player missions, starting from the very first minute of the very first level, it's demonstrated to you that you're not tied to a single straightforward path, but are instead able to choose your own adventure in whichever Bondian way you want. In this first example, you can either use a hacking device to open the electronic door, or use your portable grappling hook to jump up onto the ledge in front of you and proceed down a service entry. You can choose to burst in guns blazing, or be more stealthy and knock out the guard. The outcome of what you do here determines whether or not he drops a key. You'll also notice when you do certain bondish things, like using the gadgets to get around a situation, you'll hear a hit from the theme song play, indicating you pulled off a 007 move. These are mostly optional flourishes, such as hiding from approaching guards, or shooting down environmental objects on top of them, and depending on how many of them you pull off or collect, you'll be rewarded with additional weapons, skins, and characters in the multiplayer mode. The gunplay is true to its era, and it should be noted that this is actually the very first first-person shooter to arrive on the GameCube. There's a little bit of an aim assist when you get your reticule close enough to an enemy to adjust for the fact that it just isn't as precise to use a controller as it is a mouse. And that's fine, it's a very well-balanced trade-off, and you'll quickly find yourself rolling around the halls blowing away enemies, as long as you stay stocked on ammo and good weapons, and don't get yourself too dramatically outnumbered or surrounded. This even extends into the driving levels, as you are technically on rails since another character is driving at first, and you get to emerge from the sunroof to shoot out enemy cars, trucks, and helicopters. But like we mentioned in the development history, the driving levels that are sprinkled throughout the game were brought to us by the Need for Speed team. So not only do they have a vaguely familiar graphics and art style, they also play very smoothly, with of course the addition of weapons and gadgets. 007 moves also carry over to all these modes as well. Finding certain routes, pulling off certain maneuvers, and destroying enemies gives certain openings. Considering our previous coverage of the Spy Hunter reboot, there's also something pretty important to be noted here, that a big production title like this basically has its own Spy Hunter game just as one of the few layers that make up this AAA production of its day. Much like how we mentioned NBA games incorporating both the realistic simulation style and the pick up and play arcade style all in one package. Or how Grand Theft Auto 3 had just come out and basically folded an entire crazy taxi mode as just one of the side games you could play. Games were slowly growing in size and scope as they sought to envelop more and more styles and present themselves as bigger, better, higher budget experiences akin to a movie. After all, Bond movies wouldn't be Bond movies if they didn't have multiple factors, such as action, sex, gadgets, driving, style, and music all coming together. The same was proving to be true for games, at least games that were moving in the direction of mimicking movies. Without at all giving away the plotline of the game itself, as mentioned earlier, it's entirely original and very interesting, involving shadowy multinational organizations looking to use human cloning technology to nefarious ends. It's even complete with its own original it. Bond girl. I'm sure we'll think so. It's also a graphically solid title, with well-detailed texture work across all the varied environments, excellent atmospheric lighting effects to give it real signs of life and realism, and a very solid frame rate, making all of this move and flow smoothly so you can act as fast as you can think of what you want to do in each situation. 
Of course, the original GoldenEye was not just famous for its excellent single-player campaign, but also for its multiplayer modes, as it took advantage of the Nintendo 64's four controller ports to allow for four-way group deathmatches, featuring all the characters from the game. Agent Under Fire carries this tradition ahead into the next generation just as solidly as its original inspiration, with well-made arenas that very much take some inspiration from Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament. After all, this game was made using the Quake 3 engine, but also a bursting plethora of weapons that only the Bond universe could provide. In this case, since the characters were all original characters made for just this game, there's a bit less novelty than there was using Bond characters from the films, so that bit of charm is lost. But the gameplay is just as solid as it was in the past. Plus, with the additional power of next-gen systems, it runs at a respectable frame rate that the N64 could just not ever achieve. The GameCube version has one addition to the multiplayer over the PS2 original, with the system's additional power allowing for populating AI bot characters into the multiplayer matches alongside human players. And of course, the four built-in controller ports make for a good secondary multiplayer game when the crew gets done with the likes of Smash Brothers and wants to go for a shooter. So roughly 10 years after video games jumped the gun on trying to make game-like movies, we now had gained enough processing power to instead create movie-like games. While the Bond series may not be the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about the rise of cinematic games, the fact is pretty clear here that we have a fully-fledged Bond story being told entirely within the fully interactive confines of a video game rather than a film. It's a remarkable leap. While GoldenEye was a very good first-person shooter with a licensed James Bond skin, this game, while maybe not as well regarded a shooter as GoldenEye, was a fully formulated, well-rounded Bond experience, and that was something new that games could bring us.